Hey, everybody. How you doing? I hope you're having a wonderful evening or day or whatever time it is where you're at listening to this or watching it. I uh, want to welcome you to a brand new Ike Live show. And this happens to be Ike Live 2.0. Uh, um, if you've watched the first episode of 2.0, you know it's a little different format. Uh, I want to thank you for watching over 10 years of Ike Live, but we've changed it up a little bit. This is a more up close and personal look at some of the best fishermen, personalities, anglers in the sport today. Uh, I've got a good one for you guys. Um, coming off a, a pretty amazing tournament, uh, we've got a guy that I've known for a long time. I call him a veteran. He's an old guy like me, but uh, amazing angler, amazing speaker. We've got Mark Menendez joining us in just a second here, so you don't want to miss it. Uh, let me remind you guys, uh, this show, man, from day one has been brought to you by Mystery Tackle Box. Mystery Tackle Box is like Christmas to your doorstep once a month. Uh, it, it's an amazing product. If you're looking for a way to try new baits, see new lore, see stuff you might not normally buy yourself, try this product, Mystery Tackle Box. Use the promo code IKELIVE. You're going to get 50% off your first Pro Box. 30% off your first elite box. So give them a try. Mystery tackle box also brought to you by the Ike foundation. Uh, we got a couple big events coming up. Our first kids tournament is a few weeks away. Also, we have our pro-am coming up on June 10th. Uh, if you want to help get kids fishing, head on over to the Ike foundation.org. Uh, it's, it's good stuff. You're going to love it. All right. I'm going to get this guy in and uh, I actually, I'm going to go off my notes. I've got these amazing notes uh, that I wrote and they're probably worthless because I want to, I want to go off the cuff with Mark's so joining us now, Mark Menendez, Mark. Hey Mike, how are you buddy? I'm doing good. All right, listen, I'm not even going to go off these notes right now because we, we were joking right before I, I came live here, uh, that it's the glamorous life of a professional fisherman. <laughs> and you said, if I'd only known, is that, I, I mean, listen, I've said this to like half, half of me is like very humbled that I get to make a living doing this and it's amazing, but it is not a glamorous. There's a lot of other stuff going on that people don't see. Right. Absolutely. And I've always said, it's been a great excuse not to have a real job, Mike, <laughs> but what I didn't know were all the hours that I would work, that there was no paycheck associated, mostly yeah. money that way. So uh, our week this week has consisted of three days of catching up from being gone for 17 days, the last two elite events. Yes. Um, getting my boat and truck all cleaned up and ready to go and straightened up for the last three days. Then I leave tomorrow for University of Kentucky to move one out of the dorm and graduate one who's still going to be on the payroll, but graduate one from uh, University of Kentucky, come home Saturday night, and then take off to Alabama on Sunday morning, bright and early. So uh, a lot of work this week, no paycheck in sight. So, uh, yeah, I wish I'd have known. It's amazing. It's it's um, I joke all the time and people um, that aren't familiar with the sport, um, you know, I, I see them and they say, man, it must be great. Like you're living like a rock star, like those NASCAR guys. And and I'm like, man, if they only know the real story, you know, that we're 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 at the ground level, like doing all this ourselves. Like we, we don't have like helicopters flying us to the tournaments and, a, and a team. It's like, we're grinding and we're hustling, but I, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of like that. Is there an element to that? You like, like, you know, you're very in control of your own destiny and your career. Uh, it's a lot of work, but do you like that part of it? The, the, the work and the grind? I, I do. I do like it. Uh, I probably don't work hard enough anymore like I did when I was young, but uh, I do like controlling my own destiny. You know, I don't have a boss that's jumping up and down. You know, we have pro staff directors that give us direction that ask us to do things for said company, and that's fine. But, um, yeah, I like being able to make my own schedule. I like being able to uh, negotiate my own contract. I don't have an agent, never had an agent, and I think that builds real strong personal relationships within the companies you work for yeah. and so that part of it's great the part of it that we didn't think about when we were younger is you know health insurance and a retirement that you have yeah. to own. those are things that a, a nine to five guy 
we'll probably get where we won't. And we have to spend more energy, more time uh, figuring those out so that when we get in this older stage of our lives, Mike, um, we'll have a little something where we can still continue to go fishing way into our, our later ages. Man, I, I, I'm going to go out of order because I had this in my notes, but I had it toward the end. And, and, and you mentioned something. Uh, we, we have a lot and a lot and a lot of young guys that watch this show or listen to it. We have a lot of so many emails come through high school anglers, college anglers that listen to it as they're driving, as they're going to the next event. And, um, you know, I want to I, I want to stress that. It's not just fishing. You know, so many of them are so focused on the fishing. And you've done such a great job in your career on the business side. Uh, I, honestly, I'm not just saying this because you're in front of me right now. But, dude, you have done a great job of building these long-lasting relationships. And, and, dude, that's amazing. That's hard to do. So for those kids, and, like, even me, I want to know because you've been so good at it. How, how did you get good at that? Like, how does that, how does that happen for a high school or college kids listening to this? And they say, I want to be with a Yamaha my whole career. I want to be with a strike King my whole career. How do I do that? What, how are you so good at that? Well, you know, one of the things that I've always said is do what you say and say what you do. If you tell your pro staff director at Yamaha, you will be there at 5 PM for this promotion. Yeah. For promotion be there yeah be humble enough mike if they ask you to pick up a broom pick up a broom and right. be done because if it's good for the company it's good for you and right. i had a right. long conversation yesterday with one of my dearest friends in the whole world whom i've worked for she's now retiring um from uh, from the from the business and and we talked about those days when uh you know in 2007 2008 2009 when the economy tanked, mm, we yep. all took cuts. Oh, yeah. I didn't want to take a, a cut in salary, but I told them then, I said, look, I will work twice as hard for half as much. Um, and, and then did what I said I was going to do. So yeah. uh, being honest, providing a, a an outlook of what you've done over this quarter or the six months um, pertaining to um, – Appearances like this, uh, boat shows, actual sales that you may have made with the yeah. uh, blue buyer's name and address and the serial number. Of the show, boat. show them results, right? Show, give them results of what you're doing. So it, there's so much more to it than just fishing. Early on in your career, yes, it's about the fishing. You have to get to a level of proficiency with your craft, and that's called the Elite Series. Yeah, uh, get there, and you can maintain that. Then you have the option to move around and do other things. Yeah. What's the, I, I mean, for, for a kid listening right now and he's saying, man, I thought it was just fishing. You know, what, what is that breakdown? One, once they get to the level where they're they qualified, they're in what, 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 what's the percentage breakdown of fishing versus the business side? Is it 50, 50? Oh, is it 60, 40? Uh, oh, no, no. In the beginning, you know, I remember turning boats back into the boat company with 400 hours on them. Right fished the fishing first yeah was all fishing and then the rest of it you know it was a it was a lot of hours on the other side very little sleep working all the time yeah now, i don't get to fish near as much as i do i've got seven kids uh, a family a wife a house to deal with plans on building a new house we've got all of this going on plus i have to maintain the work for my sponsors and yeah. fishing the elite series. So now my boat only has 125 hours at the end of the year where it used to have 400. So the yeah. guys out there better know that all the fishing they're going to do in the beginning, it's going to decrease at rapid rate. Wow. It's going to have a little bit of a drop off as they go on. Yeah. It's I'd agree a, with that. I yeah. That's fishing. Yeah. Well, speaking of fishing, I, I, let's go back to last week because first off, congratulations, dude. I, I, uh, I yelled at you out the window on that last day you were getting gas. I said, catch 40 pounds. Well, you came close. You, you, you <laughs> made a good run at it there. Uh, but I, I thought it was in a very impressive tournament. And, um, you know, like for me, I struggled to figure anything out. And, and honestly, I'm being honest right now. I was almost lost. Like, um, 
I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it. I was lost in the trees. You sure. know, I can remember the second practice day, I just fished thousands of trees and I would every once in a while get a bite, but I felt like lost in the trees. And then, you know, it's so, it's so neat when you're fishing an event because when you don't make that final day or you don't make the third day, you get to watch live, you know? And, and it's like, I could have swore like I, it, before I knew what you were doing, I'm like, Oh man, that Mark found something offshore. He's cranking. It's something sneaky, sneaky. He's, you know, and then I turn on live and I'm like, what? he's fishing trees. I'm like, I fished a thousand trees. I was so like mad, not mad at you, but mad at me for not figuring it out. But so the first question is, how did you find the right trees? And like, if I had Luke on who won, I'd ask him the same thing. Like you had trees that they lived on. And I'm so curious how you were able to define that, you know? Well, it's kind of, it's kind of a two part story. I found this area last year and got a few bites in it, but couldn't make it work in the tournament. Mm. And I've caught some fish there in the past and never made it work in a tournament. Yeah. So, Mike, in practice, I had five or six bites. I did get one bite the first day. Not sure if I got a bite the second day. Right. Third day, I got one bite on this group of trees and then went up to the stump hole and got four or five more bites. So I didn't have a lot to go on. But when I caught the one fish off of those trees, it was a six plus pound fish. And I said, if these fish get here, these are the winners. Right. You know, one of the coolest things about tournament fishing is as you go through the tournament days, you learn. Yeah. To get this area in the system or that area out of the system. And uh, day one, I rolled up to those trees. I caught a four pounder on a, a 4.0 square bill, a great big wobble plug. And I'm thinking that's, and that's what I found the fish on this time. Fished about 30 minutes, picked up that old cutter worm and I caught a seven pounder. And mm. so I had a little juice going there. I'm thinking, you know, I've got two for 11 the first morning. Good shape. I'll run on up to the stump hole, fill out a limit. I'll be in great shape. So that's yeah. what I did. Day two, I get back to that area. And this is where I went. Uh, I went foul. I went out of bounds here. Yeah. And um, I fished over those fish, Mike. I just fished a hint too fast. Right. So at 10 o'clock, I didn't have a bite. Went to the stump hole scrounged out nine and a half pounds, made the cut. So I didn't throw away $10,000 and I had the opportunity for something good to happen. Yeah. That's what happened day three. Something really cool happened. I figured out that it was only a bite an hour and right. to be ultra patient, make the perfect presentation with that cutter worm and I would get a bite and they were all the right ones. So by 11 o'clock, my first five was the 2713. And I stayed on the area the entire day and only caught two more fish. And the reason I stayed there is because I was afraid we would not get to fish there the final day for weather. Because um, of the wind. Yeah. We were we had forecasted, ugly forecast coming in. And the fourth day I get there, pull up to the fourth tree, and I catch not one, but I catch two, which is the first time that that happened all week that I got multiple bites. Multiples. At, at the same tree. And they were both six and a half pound fish. Wow. Hmm. I wanted a dirty 30 on the third day. I got a heck of a start for a dirty 30 today. Yeah. I thought I have 30 and Luke's got to stumble. Right. So I didn't quite get to 30, but uh, I caught two more big ones out there. The wind picked up, went to the stump hole, never got a bite, made a treacherous run back to Tawkaw Creek that took me over an hour and had a few minutes left in Tawkaw, ran to the back of Tawkaw, caught a pound and a half and got my limit fish. And, uh, and, and was in the runner up spot. So did I see this coming, Mike? Hell no. Wow. Was, was I happy? just, just ecstatic, unbelievably ecstatic to make the runner up spot. And this is the second tournament this year, Mike, that I have jumped on the third day of the tournament, 31 or 32 points. Wow. So I went from 49 to 18. This one, I went from 34 to second. So those are, that's like having an extra tournament under my ba- belt in point. Oh, yeah. Just on day three finishes. And, and I, I'm, I'm super excited about those two, those two days. That's for sure. 
That's crazy. What a, what a great tournament. And two things stick with me as, as you were talking. The one is that mindset. Um, you, you know, I, I can tell you how hard it is to know you're fishing for five, six, seven bites, right? Like you, you talked about that. Like the third day, you knew, like, I'm not going to get a lot of bites. How, how do, can someone prepare for that mindset? Like, cause that's a tough mindset to get into. You know, the only way you can basically learn that is come from an area where fishing is really tough. You right. know, the central Midwest, Ohio, Illinois, places like that where guys will stay on one fifty yard stretch and get five bites all day and right. they do really, really well. And it's hard to learn that. You know, the grass is always greener. I've seen Mike's Iconelli's Yamaha going that way and going that way, you know, yeah. with your head on fire a thousand times. But as I've aged it's about efficiency. And if I can be efficient and put that bait in front of big ones instead of burning gas, right? Now, when you're burning gas, you're looking for active fish. These fish were primarily post-spawn and were coming to me. I did catch a couple of pre-spawners, but these were coming to me. And they they just, you, Mike, it's like somebody cut your line. It's like your bait, you, you lost your bait. Right. They weren't real aggressive. And it, it just suited me well to just stay in my comfort zone. A flipping stick, 20-pound line, and a 5 aught gamakatsu hook. Doggone it, that is an efficient way to fish. You don't lose many once you get them on. Right. It was cool to know every time I realized I got a bite, I was getting ready to crack a big one. It was a big one. Yeah. That... You know, five and a half to six and a half pounder, maybe seven pounder, just about every time up there. That's such a good feeling. We're not going to see that at the Sabine uh, in a few tournaments. We will not see that, but that's such a cool feeling at Santee. But but you hit the other thing, which I which which really stands out to me, which is in a tournament where ninety percent of the guys were throwing wacky rigs and jigs at Cypress Trees, wacky rigs, jigs, wacky rigs, jigs, everybody. You threw a very unorthodox bait. I consider unorthodox for cypress trees, which is a cut tail, the, the cutter worm. Why that? Talk, I, I want to know. I want to pick your mind on that. Why that big worm? Why that? Why that style of worm? That what, big worm, Mike, is a big meal. It's okay. a big bulky worm. It's bigger in diameter than, say, any kind of stick worm that you've got. Yeah. This has this big flange tail on the back of it and that thing when it falls it says thum 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 so it almost feels like a number three or a number four colorado wow it, so i i use two different size weights i use the quarter ounce weight and i use the five sixteenths the only reason i used the five sixteenths was the final day because of the wind i just couldn't mm. feel the quarter right. and i wanted that bait to fall as slow as i could because of these the post spawn fish mentality they they just didn't want to move for it but i'll yeah. you know, they're kind of like us mike they're lazy they want yeah. the meal they can get for the least amount of er effort expended and that was the whole concept a big meaty bait that was falling slowly mm. that they did not have to chase down that fell right in their face so that cutter worm and i go way back uh at um uh, lake fork last year i used it virtually the same way catching spawning fish on Lake Fork, which we were there in, in mid-May, yeah. and I found a spawning pattern in about five to eight feet of water in that I had to know, I had to have a couple of different kinds of timber on there, and when I found that specific mix of timber, there was two or three spawners on every darn piece of that, and that cutter worm got me about 60-some pounds in three days. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, it, that, definitely something I wouldn't have thought of, but I, I, I love that choice with that throb that sounds great now i i do i feel bad about talking about this because it seems like for the last three or four shows this keeps coming up but i have to ask your opinion on it because i got to watch you live that last day and man it was it was fun because i was doing my tackle for lay that last day and i was under a carport so i was protected while you guys were getting beat up by the rain and the wind i was protected working on tackle but i i was watching live it was fun man uh, and I heard you say something about active target, right? Now, this is like beating a dead horse. Guys, if you're watching and listening to this, I'm, I apologize, but I have to ask Mark about this. Uh, I heard you mention that 
you were purposely not using active target. Like you were turning it off because you felt like it was negatively affecting the fish. And I've, I've personally seen that myself as well in, in a day and age where guys are, I, I mean, they've, it's almost become like a crutch for guys. It's almost become like, you know, like if their active targets not working, they're like panicked, like, <laughs> like, 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 like they want to go back to the dock uh, in a day and age of that. And, and here's you not, not using it on purpose. Talk a little bit about that. Cause I, th I think it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, what I noticed, Mike, there were big catfish in my area and there were big stripers in my area. I caught several stripers on that worm. I caught some catfish on that worm. Mm. So think of a single cypress tree, five feet of water, and yeah. it became very apparent what fish was what. The stripers were high in the water column. They would be 18 inches to 24 inches under the surface. The catfish were kind of roaming around the trees uh, two to five feet away from that. And then if you saw a blip at the base of the tree, then you knew it was probably a bat. Yeah. So seeing when I would shine my active target on that tree, that laser beam, I would see movement of fish leaving. My stripers would move off the tree. The mm. catfish would disappear. And if there were one or two blips on the bottom, they disappeared too. Wow. Now, the one reason I turned it off, Mike, was there was current in my area, a slight amount of current. Current does two things for us. It positions and points those fish in a distinctive direction. Yeah. So I knew where they were looking. I knew that if I found a tree that either had a couple of trees next to each other, there yeah. would be a bigger area for those bass to hide behind to get out of that current. So I really figured out pretty quick which trees were probably the trees I was going to get a bite on. Right. In practice, I'm seeing fish leave. I knew I had limited opportunities. So I didn't want anything else to have a negative effect. Now, yeah. what I did use electronically is I used my HydroWave. HydroWave. And yeah. I, I turned it to a shallow water finesse pattern and had it just, just not really loud, but not, you know, I wasn't singing the blues out there. I wasn't having, you know, uh, a, a real loud sounds there, but just, just enough to kind of, and I really think that helped those fish kind of perk up. Uh, yeah. Does it make them bite? I don't know, but they hear that that feeding stimulation sound, and they're like, "Huh, what was that?" And the next thing I know, a bait drops right in front of them. They eat it. You got them. Yeah. So I did use that, but uh, I felt like this was my opportunity because I had figured out the proper tree to throw at, the positioning of that fish. They were right on the bottom, right on the corner, Mike. I mean, they were just had their nose tucked in that little bit of current. So I felt like the odds were in my favor. Just go fishing. Yeah. And, and not have to look at active target. Now, yeah. there are so many situations where if I don't have active target on, I'm blind. I'm not saying it, that I'm done with active target in any shape, fashion, or form. Right, right. But this time, I was smart enough to see negative effects, and I, I thought it was the best move for me to, to just turn that off and be as stealthy as possible. Yeah, it's awesome. And and I think, you know, for a lot, of, especially, you know, the, the, the guys that have been around, you know, so – both of us have been around for a little bit. I think we're able to fish like that example you gave, you were fishing instinctively. You were, you know, you were using your fishing instinct to know the trees and the position of the fish. Um, do you think, and this is it, I, I just, I, I want young, especially younger people. I want them to be aware of this. Do you think people now are relying too heavily on active target? Are they, are they using it as a crutch? Are they losing their instinctive ability? Um, you know, this a, a, as technology advances, are are these young anglers losing their instinct to fish? I I hundred percent agree with you. Think when we got GPS for the first time. Yeah. You punch a button and you have a waypoint, and that's the area you want to get back to. What that did for me is it robbed my whole sense of triangulation. I lost that ability to triangulate. Yeah. But when I was young, I could be screaming with my hair on fire down the middle of Kentucky, like throw the throttle in neutral, turn the motor up, grab a rod, stand up, and hit the one stump that was on the corner of that ledge. Wow. Because I could look up here, here, and here, 
and have my triangulation marks, make the cast and hit it. Now I go to that same ledge and I see my waypoint. I'm like, well, I know there's a stump out. It, it's, it, it, no, it's not over. It's, it, oh, 15 minutes later, I find it. Yeah. So technology robbed a skill from me. The one thing I really think it's going to rob, because now you're just basically looking down and you're following fish wherever, wherever they may roam, is um, the angle of the cast, the angle of that presentation changes. So I think one of the things that you and I've relied on our entire um, careers is, is how that fish was positioned, mm. how we presented that bait, and then we figure out which is the most effective angle to present that crankbait or that worm or that jig. Right. And now it doesn't matter. It's a video game. Right. And, you know, they may be perpendicular to the bank or throwing completely over their shoulder or following those fish out in deep water where you and I before would have never done that. So I really feel we're going to gain new skills from the technology, but we might tarnish and lose some other ones as well. And, and, and that, that's what's kind of hard for me to adjust to the whole um, forward facing movement. Yeah. It's a good lesson. Uh, I've, I've said this before on another podcast, but uh, my son Vegas is 12 He's really getting into the tournament fishing now, and he's fishing these junior tournaments, the youth tournaments, and he loves, dude, Mark, he loves it. Like, he loves looking at that box, and he loves it. And I'm trying to coach him and teach him that it's a tool, right? And there's, like, times to use it and times to just go fishing. And I, I want him to be instinctive. Even at 12, I want him to learn that instinctive nature. So I, I think it's a great point. If you're watching and listening to this, don't use it as a crutch. Use it as a tool. Well, what uh, you need to do, Mike, is you need to go back in the garage and go get a 2330 flasher and <laughs> take his live scope away from yeah. him. Take that yeah, I, and make I could, it. Yeah. I could bar it from Fritz because he still has the flasher on his boat. I'm not kidding. It's still mounted on there. It's I unbelievable. Last season with one on mine, too, because I couldn't get my electronics in time. I had a 2330 up there. And it was the greatest sound and the greatest thing in the world. Oh, man. Triangulation at the Harris chain because I found a hole in the grass and caught me about 17 pounds out of it the second day to make a check. So, uh, you know, old habits die hard. But these new ones, they have their place. But I think you're right. I mean, the instinctive nature. How many times, Mike, have you had this feeling? You get a bite and you go, I'm in the wrong part of the lake. Yeah. And you take off and run 20 miles. Yeah. Go up there and you'll whack them like 25 pounds. Yeah. So that that's exciting to me when, when that happens. Yeah. To trust that gut enough to go on a whim and make a major run. And then within 15 minutes, you're like, yep, I knew I was right. That's uh, that's such a good feeling. It's such a good feeling. It's such a hard thing to teach is that instinct, right? You almost have to engage in the sport over and over and over and then learn to trust those voices that's a that's a very hard concept to teach you almost have to just do it you know exactly. it's hard to teach that one well, it's hard to teach. argument the other day i love i love to get in conversations with rick and i said rick you've got 50 years experience i've got over 30 that's 80 years of experience and why are we so reluctant to utilize the new technology or utilize new technique he said yeah. we're not willing to change a yeah a new fresh opinion will do things that we won't do because we have successes built in history where we won't change and yeah. that's how we get our butts handed to us mike by some of these young kids yeah most talented group of fishermen i've ever fished with is on the elite series today I, i'd agree i'd agree and i can tell you please guys if you didn't realize look at my track record last year i i didn't catch a bass and i got my butt kicked by these young guys last year they're Really, 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 really good. Uh, speaking of teaching, I, I, I do want to jump to another topic. Um, dude, I, I've been doing this a long time like you, and um, I've been teaching a long time. And I've, got a, a, I've had the cool opportunity to be in the class with you several times, whether it's uh, the old bass uh, master uh, you, uh, classes or the new bass use or shows, whatever. I've had the chance to share the stage with you. Um, and you are honestly, I would, I would say, if not number one, number two, you're one of the best instructors, one of the best teachers I've ever heard, I've ever seen. Uh, it's amazing. Um, and a lot of people 
today are very reluctant to teach. Like I, I love it, and I know you love it because I, I, the passion oozes out, and I could see. Um, but, but there's a lot of people that don't want to give the juice, that don't want to give the goods away. What, what, what would you say to them, and 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 why have you been so good at it? Like, what's what's the magic? Like, how do you do that? Because you you captivate an audience, and it's great info. Like, you're a great teacher. Well, I appreciate that, Mike. It it first I'll give shout out to my mother. She's been in education for 47 years. So I came from an education background. I watched my mother teach. I watched my mother speak. Um, so, so I learned a little there. I never dreamt that the most important class I took in um, my, my college career, I do have a degree in fisheries biology, but the most important class I ever took was basic public speaking. I didn't know that that would be the basis for my career. Yeah, And then working with Gary White all those years, um, it just kind of came to me one day, Mike, and I thought, you know, what are the odds that these students in this classroom are going to be fishing the same events that I am? Very small. Yeah. Those guys love to fish just as much as I do. Yeah. So tell them the real skinny. And, and you know, some guys kind of go over the edge and, it's it's just a promotional speech. Well, I use this Strike King deal, and you know my Seaguar line and my Yamaha outboard, and my Skeeter boat. It, it and it and it becomes it it becomes too commercial, right? So when you're teaching them a technique and why that cutter worm falls the way it does, and why I used it for the postponed fish like this week, and how I use it as a spinner bait, and how it's a great you know Thunder Cricket trailer uh, or any kind of bladed jig trailer things like that they're kind of like huh that that's real life that's right. real stuff there and once you they realize you're telling them the real life stuff you've earned their trust and they will listen yeah. so I, I just felt like i've been lucky enough to do this forever and ever and ever i was lucky enough to to, to accomplish all the goals i ever wanted to give back to the sport and give somebody else the joy and the luxury that I've had with all of those millions of hours of fishing, yeah. the learning curve so they can catch at least one more bass. Yeah. Uh, and that was my whole mindset on it. And uh, it, I appreciate you pointing out that it has served us both very well. Yeah, it has. And I, I think you, you hit the point perfectly where I think people are afraid they're giving away something that will hurt them. Sure. When in reality, you know, you're helping a lot of things you're helping yourself you're helping the sport you're helping the fan base right you're like you're i, I can tell you the connections that i make at that level the uh, the grassroots level with people it's the strongest like that's the most like social media is great and tv is great right but man when you're there and you looking someone in the eye right and you're creating that bond Dude, you're changing somebody's life potentially. That's so powerful. Like it's a, it's pretty heavy when you think about it. <laughs> it is. And, you it's know, pretty heavy. Now, now with high school and college fishing, these these young anglers, their learning curve, it's like going up Mount Everest, where right. you know, it was like a long flat hill, and then we'd hit a jog and it'd go up. So you know they're learning more. I mean, you can assimilate information quicker. You know, Mike, you could you could devise a new technique on the next time you're on Bassmaster Live, yeah. and in 15 minutes, that kid can go out there and do the I, same thing you were doing that, that you've thought about for years. Yeah. So yeah. It, it moves fast, but uh, I just do feel a tremendous responsibility to share the knowledge that I've learned over the years. And, um, you know, if it hurts me, it hurts me. I don't think it will, but yeah. um, I think it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's definitely the right thing to do. You've done a great job at it. And, and, and this is a, this is actually a great segue. Um, you know, speaking of the right thing to do, the other thing that I see so much in the sport, and we've had a couple issues here in New Jersey just recently. Um, and, and these were access issues, but you know, you see all these things happening, uh, in, in, in the fishing world, you see, um, access being closed. You see, uh, you know, pollution issues, you see invasive. invasive, invasive species issues. And you hear so many guys 
just, you know, bitching and crying and, ah, oh, you know, fight, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but, but then like a week goes past and they're not doing anything. They're just, they're right. just crying about it. You, you're one of the few anglers that has taken a political route to help with these problems. I want you, I, I'm so, I'm so proud of you for doing that, but talk a little bit about that and talk about like how I, I really think a lot of people watching and listening think they can't help. You know, they, they think oh, I'm just a dude from Jersey or I'm just the guy from Kentucky. I'm just, I'm just this. I'm just, I can't help. Talk a little bit about, you know, you've done so much, but talk about that, but talk about how they can help. Cause I think that's important for people to know. The first thing a dude that loves to fish can do and help us is when he goes to a public body of water, take a garbage bag with him and take 10 minutes yeah. and yeah. pick up beer cans and trash and worms and fishing line and dispose of it. Yeah. Make, make our waters cleaner and better. That is yeah. a very simple thing to do. It takes 15 minutes to do and has a tremendous impact. Yeah. Tremendous impact. You know, I saw firsthand what invasive species can do to an economy, to my lake, to the rivers. The incredible, incredibly damaging. Lake. Yeah, and, incredibly uh, damaging. Yeah, and and the economy collapsed, Mike, quickly. So did the fishery. I'm yeah. proud to say that Kentucky Lake is well on its way back. It takes yes. a four and a quarter pound average to win any tournament here now. You know, it's not what it once was where you could go out on the ledges and catch a hundred a day, but you and I could get in the boat and go out and have a nice day of fishing and expect to catch between eight and 15 keeper bass in a day's yeah. time with yeah. several of those being four pounders. So it's getting better. You know, luckily we've both partnered with companies that give back. Yep. And first is AFCO that awesome. 10 percent of everything they sell goes back to conservation that's yeah. huge super important yeah. unbelievably important that a manufacturer gives back then we both have partnered with yamaha for years and the right waters initiative with yamaha is one of the strongest things going the uh red snapper issue out there in the gulf where uh, the snapper industry basically said you can't go fishing with your family and take any of our snapper we got in there and got it changed where there's a season now that people can yeah. take their families out there, catch some food. There are plenty of snapper out there now. I, we took, I took the invasive species route with the war on carp uh, and got Yamaha behind that, got AFCO behind that. And we were lucky enough to go to a Capitol Hill. And I've spoken to about 60% of lawmakers, head of fish and wildlife, the Senate majority leaders, all of those folks, and was able to bring it to a, a level in which they understood, and it was the the economics of it. Got yeah. lots of money for our area, and a lot of that money got spent with multiple states, fish and wildlife, arming themselves with the technologies and trainings to do something about the Asian carp, yeah. and um, it, it works so well. So um, I just felt like that was something I needed to do to give back to the industry and the sport that has given me a, a life, a livelihood, and makes me happy. I just didn't want, I wanted to leave it in better shape than when I found it. And yeah. even if guys just don't throw your plastic worms in the lake, if you can right. help it, throw them in the bottom of the boat, dispose of them later. Don't throw your fishing line in the lake. If you get hung in fishing line, pull it up and put it in your boat, put it in your cooler. Yeah. Little things like that can really help. Um, it doesn't take a lot, but a lot of yeah. little things can make a big, big difference in our world. Yeah. Hats off to you for doing all that. And, uh, definitely I, if, if you're listening and watching and, you know, you know, g get to the next level, talk to your local representative, talk to your state representative. I mean, there's a lot of anglers. There's a lot of us out there and there's definitely a strength in numbers. So, uh, you can make a difference. Uh, I, I, I want to leave you with one, one last thought here. Uh, and, and this is one that this is for me, this, this whole, this whole podcast so far was fun and I hope it was great for everybody watching and listening but i've got one for me and this one's this one's a tricky one to ask and and and, and i've struggled on how to ask you this but um you've been through some ups and some downs in your life and in your career and you you've been through you know some that are personal 
some that are physical. And when I look at your career, I look at the way that you've been able to bounce back from things that surely for me, I think would have taken me out, whether it was some personal stuff or whether it was physical stuff. Like I look at that, I think, man, man, Mark's been through some shit and he's still freaking here and he's still competitive and he's still one of the best promoters. And like, I want to know what, ha, how you do that. I want to know like the drive that keeps you going because, you know, we all have things in our lives that happen that take us to, that are bad, right? That, that aren't great, right. whether it's personal or physical. And a lot of us want to just, you know, you want to, you want to just quit, right? They're devastating things. And you, you want to just say, I can't do this. I, I give up. I, I can't do it anymore. And I am so, uh, my, I admire you so much for working back after these things. Talk about that. Cause that's something that, man, I think, I think people listening, everyone has stuff that happens in their lives. And I think it stops people in their tracks sometimes, and they don't want to keep going. And you, you have kept going. Talk about that. It's amazing. It's amazing. You're going to choke me up, Mike. You're going to I'm choking up talking about it because it's ma it's making me teary eyed here talking about oh, it. Oh, I've I, you know I've had um, in 2005 I contracted meningitis at Gunnersville. Um, was in the hospital 17 days. My daughter was six months old, and I and my wife Donna had told me that we were getting ready to have another one. And uh, I was unconscious for seven of those 17 days. And I remember having this thought in that stupor of sleep. I've got a six month old. I've got one on the way. And I don't want anybody else to be their dad. And all of a sudden, Mike, my eyes open. I wow. came back. Wow. Fought through that illness for months i went to the opens uh in 2005 and i won the first one i won the first one going away um the second issue that i've had to fight through was cancer it was donna's cancer she passed away from pancreatic cast cancer in 2014 yeah and it was really hard to watch someone that you love evaporate yeah but that's what happened yeah we were my first tournament back in 2015 was at the sabine river Mike, I did not want to be there. Yeah. I didn't want to be anywhere near a bass boat. Yeah. Now, I'll get choked up on this. The Sabine is not a tremendous fishery. It is when not. I, when I got to the boat ramp for the first day of practice, and you know how the parking lot is. There's three or four rows of parking there, and then you get over to the ramp. The boat was in the water. It took me 45 minutes to get from my car, my truck and trailer, to the ramp. Wow. Because of the fine people of Orange, Texas. Yeah. Hugs, kisses, and encouragement. Wow. I, 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 it, that was the hardest time I ever had to put one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And three hours later, I had a good stretch of bank in that place. And three, and this is the God's honest truth, Mike. This is the absolute truth. I hadn't had a bike. I was contemplating putting it on the trailer. It was the last time that you would see me. So I picked up a flipping stick and had a tube on it that was affixed to my reel. So I put the hook in the tube. So I'm standing there with that tube in my left hand and casting rod and reel in my right hand. That's all the line was out on that rod and reel. So I threw the tube in the water and dropped the rod tip down. And I looked up into the sky and I said, sweetheart, put a fish on this for me, please. Put one on there. Wow. In the middle of the ditch, I lifted the rod up and a three and a half pounder came over the side. Oh my gosh. So it's that's a that's an amazing story. I've never heard that story before. I haven't told that story much. That's an amazing story. In the next 15 minutes, I had a limit and was culling and was in 10th place after the first day. The second day I caught three. The third day was a monsoon. All you could fish was a spinnerbait. It was raining so hard. And I fish over this tree, this lay down tree. It's the only tree in the canal. And I'm like, turn around, dummy. It's the only place a fish is going to be. 
And I looked up into the rain. I said, honey, here's your chance. And I catch not one, but two three and a half pounders out of that tree. And I said, sweet, if we do this three more times, we're fishing on Sunday. I didn't get another bite. <laughs> but uh, uh, she floats around. She's around our family all the time. The third thing no. that happened to me was in, in 2020, 2020. I slipped a disc at Ufala. I was winding a 6XD. A bass did it. I sweep my rod into the hook set, and uh, I popped the disc out, and that was as debilitating as ever. So I missed the 2020 season. Um, you know, those long-standing relationships, um, when Donna was fighting cancer for two years, every sponsor I had, Mike, stood behind me. Yeah. Not for one year, but two years in which they executed their contracts. They did their uh, due diligence on what was expected of them, and I did not have to fish. I just had to take care of my wife and my family. Yeah. And that's why my tournament jersey has not changed in over 20 years. Yeah. Um, it's why I stayed at Bass. I was asked to do uh, the new league, and I said, I can't do that for the people that supported me while my wife was dying. Right. They paid me yep. to Bass, and that's why I stayed, stayed there. So, you know, you, you there's one thing that drives every angler from the young kid that's getting started to old farts like us, Mike, that have fished for eons. And the thing that makes me tick is when I get that bite and I knew I made that bass do something he didn't want to do. Right. And that is the mitigating circumstance that has pushed me through the dark days when I was crawling in the mud Yeah. Um, to last week where I was on top of the world. Yeah. So, um, it, it, it's an amazing thing, and it's been the support of those people that we shook hands at, at media events, at Bass U's, whatever it was. This, the, the encouragement has poured in for years and still does, and, and I'm grateful for that. Wow. that Mark, that was, it, it's such an amazing story, and what a fighter you are, you know, to fight through that stuff and to do something that you love, right? It's like... Uh, I hear that story and it's like loud and clear that fishing kept you going, right? That like this whole thing that you started as a young man, the ups and downs, it kept you going. And it's incredible to, to hear that. And um, man, well, I, I, I it, to it's, say it's too, so powerful. It's powerful, man. I have to just say too, um, I met someone after Donna died. She went through the same thing I did in losing a spouse. We became friends. We built a friendship that's impenetrable. Now it's a full blown. She's the most wonderful thing in the world. And her name is Melissa. She's five foot two, dark haired. She's mean as hell. Let me tell you, she is just mean and spunky and fun. And blending our families together with the seven kids that we had uh, together is is just it, it's incredible it's fun yeah. i'm an only child mike so i yeah, don't have me too. brothers and sisters me too and, and and this chaos of all of these kids and life and ups and downs and and having the support of of melissa behind me now um it it, it truly makes it all worth it uh the walk through life together that we go through now is just yeah. so much better so much stronger so much more fun um you know, uh, without her, I don't know that I could have done it the last 10 years for sure. Yeah, that's it. It's incredible, man. And, and, uh, the, the way that you've stayed in the sport, your longevity through the ups and downs, it's so amazing. And I, I, I live by never give up, but man, that is the embodiment of never give up, of keep pushing. And, you uh, can't. you have to strive, you have to push, you have to make things better. If it wasn't better for me, I had to make it better for Max and Caroline, my two babies that lost their, their mom at eight, nine years old. They were just babies. Yeah. So yeah. I had to be, I had to be both a mom and a dad. I had to yeah. learn to cook, dude. <laughs> I had to learn to do laundry, you know, mundane things like that. But you have to push forward. Yeah. Just because you're stuck in the mud doesn't mean you have to be there long. You can wash those shoes off, get that mud off there and keep trudging and good things will happen. And, and I truly believe that. I, I think if you work hard, you can do uh, some amazing things. And 
heard a story this week about a young person that's had a traumatic life and um, she's never given up. And uh, it, it, it sends chills down my spine to know what this young woman has been through. And, and she's, she is going to be a professional person in the health career with a health career here now. And it's, a, it's amazing. So if you think you've got it bad, somebody else may have it worse. Yeah. And um, fishing is just a good way to uh, stay calm and be able to work your problems out and get to the other side of the fence in the best way possible. I'd, I'd agree. I'd agree. And man, listen, if you're watching and listening to this, please, man, li take, take a really big note on this segment because honestly, I've been doing Ike Live now. This is uh, 10th year. And that was one of the most powerful stories of, you know, a positive, ad an attitude to keep you going no matter what. It was amazing. And uh, Mark, I I'm going to tell you, dude, you are for sure a role model for a lot of people. Um, when people look at someone, want to emulate their career and their life, they're going to look at you because it's, uh, it's amazing what, what you've done in the sport. So thank you. For, from my standpoint, thank you. But I know I'm saying that for a lot of people. Man, thank you being, for being who you are. It's, just, uh, it's, it's been cool to watch over the years. You've done well, a great I, job. I appreciate it, Mike. And, you know, you just you just got to be who you are and, and do what you do and um, just try to do the right thing. And, and yeah. like I said earlier, do what you say and say what you do. And, and that's the best. That's been the best motto for me. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Um, we Here's the thing. You've got a lot of work ahead of you still. I've got tomorrow. I'm going to kind of relax tomorrow, but you got a lot of work ahead of you tomorrow and then a drive on Saturday. Uh, but we got Lele coming up. I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see you there. I hope we both have good tournaments again. I mean, I had an okay tournament. You had a great tournament. I would take another okay tournament, you know, the next one. I just, man, them top 50s. If I can just get keep getting top 50s, I feel good about it. You know what I mean? So, Oh, absolutely. These whippersnappers are so good. I good. feel like I'm stealing from them when I, have, when I get a check from them. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I'm really looking forward to this one just because uh, of the spotted bass element. A Coosa River spotted bass, for those who haven't caught one, it should be a bucket list. Because you yeah. could take a three-pound Coosa River spotted bass, three feet of line, and tie it to a tail of a three-pound smallmouth, and the spot's going to drown that smallmouth every time. They're it, badass. They're badass, dude. Badass. Because they would eat jet skis and bass boats if they did. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, they're they're the coolest bass that swims, and uh, I've always had a warm place in my heart for a spotted bass. So. I'm excited about that part of it for next week, for sure. Me too. Me too. All right. Before we go, real quick, I do want to let people know, Mark, I'll put you on the spot here real quick. You have a really cool YouTube series going on. Uh, very, very cool. I love it. Tell everybody about it. Uh, I, I want to make sure people know about it. Where can they watch it? Such a cool series. What do you got going on? It's, uh, it's Mark Menendez Bass TV. You can see yes. it on YouTube. It is a local television show that I do here in my local area, and it is teaching it's not two guys in a boat slapping high fives it is me trying to show you what i've always done and how to catch more fish um it we're we're in our fifth season it's a lot of fun i work with kevin baxter the bait man a lot of you may watch the bait man. i'm going on his cast here in a little while at seven o'clock so um kevin and i've been friends a long time and he does a great job with it um and you can find me at mark menendez bass on instagram Otherwise, if you want to send me a message or whatever, that'd be great. But uh, it's about teaching and learning and how to make people better fishermen. So that's that's what the whole concept is. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Mark, thank you for coming on. Man, what what a, I, I'm actually like shook up. Like I feel like I go got to go have a cocktail now or a beer or something. I'm, I'm still kind of it was an amazing uh, interview for me. So thank you for coming on and drive safe, travel safe. Don't don't work too hard tomorrow. And I'll see you at Lay Lake. Well, the same to you. Under 100 in between the ditches on the way down from New Jersey, Mike. I know you like that. You like to have that kayak in the wind. And uh, we'll get these kids taken care of. Getting that one out of college is a big step for Melissa and I. Yeah, congrats. He, goes back, he goes back into dental school this fall. So we're really proud of him and getting our freshman out of uh, the dorm. And she's moving into the sorority house. So um, good stuff for that. But I appreciate you having me. I look forward to seeing you. And Tell Beck and the whole gang I said hello, and we will see you Monday morning. See you Monday.
There you have it, folks. Mark Menendez, everybody. Man, I'm not I didn't just say that. Now I got I've got Mark off. So he he can't I don't think he could even hear me anymore. Dude, what a amazing interview. Uh gosh, I I still I've still got chills a little bit and I'm still a little shook up from that and uh man, it's such a good attitude. Like you have to have that mentality in life. And if you don't have that mentality in life, change it and have that mentality, have that outlook. And that's longevity in the sport. That's how you're going to make it 30 plus years in the sport. All right. Um, I hope you enjoy this new series, dude. This thing's crazy. Like, look at me, I'm teary eyed. Uh, but mystery tackle box has supported us from day one. And we're still the only live podcast that does an unboxing. Um, let me remind you, if you're watching and you don't know about Mystery Tackle Box, go to mysterytacklebox.com. Use the promo code Ike Live. You're going to get 50% off your first Pro Box. You're going to get 30% off your first Elite Box. And tonight, we're going to be unboxing a uh, Pro Box for you tonight, okay? This is one of my favorite things. This thing comes to your doorstep. It's like you shake it. Like, What's in there? You're, you're, you're anxious, but when you see that seal and you break that seal, I love it. I love it. Here it goes. Listen, you heard that? You heard the pop of the seal? And we're doing a pro box tonight. There's some really, really cool stuff in this box. Um, I'm going to pick two things. I'll give you a quick view of some other stuff. We've got hooks. We've got uh, a Streak Z. This is like a bait. Like Gussie just won the classic on by Z-Man. Uh, we have X zone crawls. You might know that guy, Brandon Polinick on the front. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, we've got a top water. We've got, uh, some worms, some regular worms, but I got to pick just two. Let me, let me pick two. All right. I've got two that I'm picking out of this box and this is just amazing. Some of the stuff that you'll get. Okay. Here's two of my favorite picks from this box. First one is a cross-eyed Z chatterbait. Now, a lot of you throw the chatterbait, but listen to me. This is one by David Walker, and it has a fiber guard on it, okay? So if you fish a chatterbait, you know they're not so good around wood. Guess what? Here's one that has a fiber guard a lot better around wood, something you could fish around wood. I love that one. And then the next one I'm going to show you is a little crankbait and really unique because this is a hybrid crankbait it's not quite a round square bill it's not quite a flat side it's something sort of in between this is called a jolt 2.5 i like the shape i like the bill i like the color kind of a golden shiner color definitely something that's different than a lot of crankbaits I have in my box already. So uh, give them a try. Mystery Taco Box. Head on over to the website, mysterytacklebox.com. Don't forget, use that promo code Ike Live. Dude, you're going to get 50% off this box. That's crazy. It's like getting the stuff for free. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this, man. This is the brand new Ike Live 2.0, bringing you a lot of interviews that are, I would call them more up close and personal. So I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at the next one. Bye. You know, right now where we're standing, we're in Camden, New Jersey. Yeah. Philadelphia is right there. This is the concrete jungle. And, you know, a lot of those kids, as they grow up, they don't fish. It's interesting because they're surrounded by water. You know, the, the Delaware River, the Schuylkill, ponds, city park lakes, but they don't have the influence to, to, to cast, to fish, to have a rod and reel. And that really, that became our focus, you yeah. know, is to target kids in what we call non-traditional areas, yeah. you know, urban areas, city centers, where the population's high. And, and let these kids have an experience. You know, it, it, it's amazing. I mean, some of the experiences we've had, whether it's Central Park in New York City, here in Camden, other parts of the country, even just casting, yeah. it's unbelievable to see it, isn't it? Yes. It's unbelievable. Yes. And, and uh, you know, you see these kids have this experience they've never had, 
and they light up, you know? The big thing I think for the Ike Foundation is we're not, we're not saying we want all these kids to become professional anglers. Yeah. It'd be great if some of them did, but we want them to have that fishing experience because it ties them to so, mu so many other positive things. The outdoors, nature, conservation, conservation. Uh, ecology, um, you know, all these amazing things in life that maybe they wouldn't have been exposed to any other way, we're trying to help with that. So it's, it's important, it's important for us. Yeah. We're proud of it. Four and a half inch drop shot worm, Bama bug. Finesse jig, PB and J, give me something hard. Hey, KVD here. Now, I didn't always know this much about fishing. Three aught, no, four aught EWG worm hook. In fact, there was a time when I couldn't tell the difference between a jerk bait and a stick bait. But then I signed up for Mystery Tackle Box, the original monthly tackle subscription. And now I know more about fishing than I do about calculus. And he knows a lot about calculus. Plus, I get amazing extras, like free fishing magazines. October 2016, featured article, four places to throw a frog, exclusive decals, <coughs> zombie bass, and how-to videos for all the great baits I receive. How to tune a crankbait. Is that underwater footage I smell? I got goosebumps. So if you're looking to develop enhanced fishing abilities like me, or you just like getting new tackle every month, Go to mysterytacklebox.com and get your box today. Oh. Ooh, live minnows. Is it lunch?